Hi, I'm Stefan. Um, this is collaborator in collaboration with Reto Achemann and Timothy Rosgro from ETH Zurich, as well as Tim Harris from Cor Oracle Labs in Cambridge. The problem I'm going to talk to you about today are NUMA machines. Um, you can see one example of a NUMA machine here on this picture I'm showing to you. Um, this one has four NUMA nodes and eight memory controllers, and what can happen on such a machine is that if you allocate all the memory on just one of these NUMA nodes, you can get congestion on the interconnect close to where you allocate the memory, as well as load imbalance of memory controllers. What that means for your program is that the performance now depends on where you actually allocate memory, and in case of suboptimal memory allocation, your performance can suffer. I'm going to present to you Shoal. Um, which is a combination of compiler annotations and um, a runtime library. What Joel provides to the programmers is a memory abstraction based on arrays. What we do is that we statically analyze a program for memory access patterns and then at runtime dynamically choose which of the memory allocations make sense for that concrete program on a concrete machine. I will show you that we can reduce the runtime of programs by up to 4x compared to naive memory allocation strategies. Let me give you an example. This is a shared memory version of PageRank. Um, this is a program that has a lot of parallelism. So it, what you would expect from a program like this is a perfect scalability with the number of cores. So if you throw more cores at the problem, the runtime of the bro program will decrease. Tim Harris showed you yesterday in his talk about the uh, Callisto RTS that this PageRank um, version actually has a good scalability. So um, the red bars is really what you would expect from a program like that. Now, what you can get if you have a really bad memory allocation, for example, you allocate everything on, the single, on a single node, is what is shown here with the blue bars. Um, what you see then is a con contention, contention on the interconnect as well as a load imbalance of memory controllers. So now you might wonder why would anyone be so stupid and allocate all the memory in the same NUMA node? Um, you would be surprised how easy that is. So two lines of code that probably most of you have been writing so far already is in the data initialization of your program where you first allocate memory. There you give the size of the memory you want to allocate. And then you use memset to actually initialize that memory. This is fine. There's nothing wrong with the way this program is written. Um, but what happens internally if you run this on a Linux is that Linux is not going to allocate that memory when you actually call malloc. Instead, it's going to allocate the memory when it's first touched. And then it's going to be allocated close to the thread that is actually touching the memory. So there's also nothing wrong with this policy in the Linux kernel. But the problem is that if you run both of them together, this is not going to work because this piece of code will cause all the memory to be allocated on just one NUMA node. And you will see exactly the problems I just showed you. So what would we like to do? Um, we can imply well-known techniques such as partitioning where you split up the entire working set of your program into small pieces, and then you can allocate these pieces on separate NUMA nodes. You can also replicate your memory, which means that you store a copy of your working set on each NUMA node. Um, then, of course, you have to take care of updates because you want to keep them consistent. Both of them are well-known techniques to reduce the load imbalance on the interconnect, um, they localize access patterns um, and hence reduce the interconnect traffic. Ideally, what you also want to do is use hardware features that are available in your machine, such as DMA engines or super pages. What is available to you as a programmer are fine-grained interfaces that allow you to exactly specify where to allocate memory, such, such as libnuma or higher-level functions such as mAdvice, where you can tell the kernel OK, I expect this memory to be accessed only from one thread or from all the threads, and the kernel can then go ahead and try to do something clever. What I'm going to present to you today is Shoal, um, which is a framework that tries to do this automatically. We don't want programmers to have to understand what the characteristics of a machine are. We don't want the programmers having to understand the implica implications it has on their uh, program performance. The idea um, Shoal is based on is to exploit high-level DSLs. Um, these domain-specific languages, they provide a high-level programming API that programmers can use to write down their applications. Um, it generates highly efficient parallel code. 
and it's widely used because it's so easy to program and because it generates um, such efficient code. Um, application domains where it's used are machine learning, signal processing, and graph processing. And our idea now is to derive the access patterns on memory automatically out of these languages. The example I'm going to show to you is GreenMal, a graph processing language um, that's well established. And it's nice because it stores the graphs internally as an array, which is exactly what, what we are doing. In order for you to understand the rest of the talk, it's important to understand how exactly um, the graph is sto stored as an array. Um, the technique here is called an adjacency array. Um, let me show you how this works. So we have a sample graph here shown on the right side. Um, three nodes, five edges, and we want to uh, sort this in an array. What we do now is that we group the edges by source node ID. Um, so we look at node zero, and node zero has one outgoing edge to two, so we write down two. Um, similarly, for node uh, one, we have two outgoing edges, one to zero and one to two, so we write down zero and two. And finally, for node two, we have an outgoing edge to zero and one to one. Um, now that we wrote down um, all the edges, we need to remember for each node where the first edge um, going out of that node is stored in the edges array. So we write down the indi indices in the nodes array, uh, in the edges array where um, the outgoing edges are stored. For node zero, this is just a pointer to um, node index zero. For um, node one, the index is one. And for node um, two, the index is three. With that, we have an almost complete representation of the graph. The only thing that's missing is a sentinel element pointing to the end of the array and indicating how many edges are in the system. So this is a complete representation of the graph. What we want and need now for efficient access is a reverse lookup as well so that we can go backwards um, to find, um, for example, inward neighbors. Now that you know how Green Mile stars, um, stores graphs internally as arrays, let me show you how you compile a typical Green Mile program. You start off with your program. This can be, for example, PageRank. This is going to be translated by a high-level compiler down to a low-level C code or C++ code, and then you can use your regular um, C++ compiler to translate that to a program binary. So what Joel now does is it modifies three of these parts. Um, it puts an analysis component into the high-level compiler. It puts a memory abstraction into the low-level C code. And we put a runtime library that programs can link against. I'm now going to explain all three of them, starting with the memory abstraction. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our memory abstraction is based on arrays. So we have get and set functions that programmers can use to access arrays rather than directly accessing memory. We have a copy from function that allows us to copy from other arrays as well as an init function that accepts a constant value to initialize the elements. We have these high-level functions because they allow us to use um, hardware features if present, such as a DMA engine. Then the secret sauce essentially is an annotated malloc call. So this is a malloc call that doesn't just get the size of what you want to allocate. It also has a, sub, a couple of access patterns that you specify, and that helps internally to decide what to do with them. So what are these access patterns? Uh, we have read-only, we have sequential, we have random, and we have indexed. All of them should be more or less clear. Indexed is a li little bit more complicated. What that means, and you can see an example here, is that essentially we access every element of the array in sequential order, starting with the first one, ending with the last one. So every element is accessed um, exactly once. OK, with that, um, I would like to show you what we do with the compiler. Um, essentially. There are two things happening there. One is that we need to modify the compiler to generate a low-level version of the program that uses our abstraction, our memory abstraction. And the other thing is that we extract the memory patterns I talked about already. So this is PageRank. Um, what's happening here is that for each node in the graph, um, we iterate over all the neighbors and sum up their ranks divided by their R degree. Um, and this is something we are going to look at in detail now and analyze what this, what this means for access patterns and how we read these access patterns out of there. So this, again, is the array layout we saw before. What we need now for the page rank is, of course, the rank. So this is a per node array where for each node in the graph you, you st uh, store the rank. Um, so now if you want to look up all the neighbors of a node, 
you need to look at the reverse edges and reverse nodes array to find these neighbors. Um, and first of all, you need to find the indices in the edges array that store the relevant edges. So these are two lookups where you use the, um, the ID of the node T you're interested in to look up um, the indices in the edges array. As soon as you have the start and the end of the edges array that you are interested in, you then do a range query there to get the node indices of the neighbors. So in terms of access patterns, what does this mean? Um, the first axis is an indexed read-only axis, followed by a sequential read-only axis, and then again, sequential accesses um, read-only on the edges arrays. So now already you know for a neighbor iteration exactly what the access patterns are going to be. Similarly, now that we know all the node indices of all the neighbors, um, we need to find out what their ranks are. This is the direct access on the, on the ranks array with that node ID. And of course, this now is a random access and read only. Um, random because the neighbor relationship in the graph is random. So there is no correlation between the node and its neighbors. Then you also need to determine the out degree of the neighbors. For that, again, you need to find out the boundaries within the edges array about um, the edges you are interested in, and then you just subtract them from each other. Um, and here again, you get random accesses because you look up the out degree of the neighbors that are random. So now that we understand how, um, how we derive the access pattern, let's see what we do with it. And this is the magic that happens at, in the library that is linked in the program. Um, and what we do here is we choose the error implementation based on these access patterns we have just been extracting. So what's happening here? Um, if the array is indexed, we partition it. The reason we do this is that from the index attribute, we know that we can partition the array such that um, um, if work is scheduled properly, all the accesses are going to be local. That's a um, consequence of the index property. Then we look at whether or not um, the array is, index, uh, is read only. If it's not read only, um, we are distributing it because the overhead of maintaining consistency we found is just too high on a typical multi-core machine. If the data is read only, we look if all the data, even if replicated, still fits into RAM. If that's not the case, we don't want to replicate it because we want to avoid swapping out the disk because that would make the, would, um, you know, have a bad impact on performance. If, however, everything still fits into memory, we replicate. So this is a simplified um, diagram of what Joel is doing. Um, but already here, we need a lot of hardware characteristics. Um, we need to find out if replicated data still fits on the machine. For that, we need to know um, how big the memory controllers are. Um, but also for the implementations of partitioned arrays, replicated arrays, distributed arrays, we need to understand what the machine looks like to get them right. So in summary, what we are using here is the number of nodes, the number of CPUs in the system, the available RAM per NUMA node, whether or not the machine has DMA engines, whether or not the machine has super pages. And with that, we get a complete picture of what Joel is doing. So in addition to what the original Grima um, tool chain was, we analyze access patterns in the compilation stage and feed them into the program binary that's running at runtime. Um, we also retrie retrieve hardware characteristics and also feed them in there. Before diving into related work, I would like to um, take some time to discuss some alternative approaches. Um, one of them would be to use a search page based approach to find a good configuration. In that case, you just try out various configurations, try to figure out what the best one is and use that. Another option would be to use hardware page migration where you have some hardware support that monitors who is accessing which memory page and dynamically um, sorry, migrates it to closer to where it's needed. This can also be done in software. Um, one popular program there is Carrefour, which is um, um, a really interesting project from Simon Fraser University presented uh, at ASPLOS 2013. What they do is they use, um, in the Linux kernel, they use performance counters to find out what memory access patterns are, and they dynamically um, migrate and replicate if um, they find opportunities for that. 
With that, I would like to um, evaluate Joel. I'll compare Joel to other approaches and then have a breakdown of where our performance benefits come from. You already saw the single node allocation where all the memory is allocated on one node. And we saw that this doesn't scale and we have a negative speed up with the number of cores. What many, many good programmers do is that they just randomly distribute the memory in the machine and that um, leads to um, more load balance on the memory controllers because all of them are used. Um, so that solves part of the problem. If you want to implement this on a typical Linux system, what you can do is you can use an OpenMP parallel loop to make sure that all cores are in, uh, involved in initializing memory and then because of the Linux um, first touch memory allocation strategy, memory will be allocated everywhere in the machine rather than just on one node. Um, this is what GreenMile already does internally, so people at GreenMile were um, careful to get this right. Um, the problem here is that this is OS specific. If your operating system doesn't do first touch, this doesn't work. So now uh, we have a look at CAR4. What we do here is that we just run CAR4, sorry, that we just run GreenMA within CAR4, and you can see that CAR4 detects more opportunities to um, replicate data and to migrate data closer to where it's needed, even on, on top of what GreenMA already does. This is partly because um, the GreenMA people forgot some opportunities to dis distribute memory, so part of the working set is still allocated on just one NUMA node, and also CAR4 internally, sorry, GreenMile internally doesn't replicate any data. So here we get approximately 30% improvement over the GreenMile baseline. Now finally, we have Shoal. Shoal already knows the access patterns for the entire program when it's uh, started, so it can at startup decide which areas should be replicated, which areas should be partitioned, which areas should be distributed. It um, can use hardware support such as large pages um, if they are available on the system, which allows us to get even a 20% improvement over CAR 4 that has to guess what the programmer's intention might have been based on what they observe um, with their uh, online analysis. Let's now do a breakdown of where it shows performance improvement come from. Compared to uh, a single node allocation shown in the blue bar, we get approximately two thirds improvement by just using partitioning, which ensures that the memory is spread out in the system and we um, avoid the load imbalance of memory controllers. If we also use replication, we can localize memory accesses because now every core can directly access um, the working set and they don't have to go via the interconnect, so that reduces um, the interconnect congestion. Then we can also use super pages, which gives another 20%, but that's not anything spectacular. With that, I would like to conclude. So I presented to you Shoal, and I showed you that we have this memory abstraction based on arrays. Um, we have a couple of compiler extensions that allow us to derive access patterns. We have a runtime component that then, based on that, tunes where memory should be allocated. I showed you that this works very well with um, domain-specific languages where the programmers don't have to change their program at all because everything is happening in the um, high-level compiler. Um, we also have support for manual annotation. So instead of having the high-level compiler extracting memory access patterns and writing the low-level C code, you can just do this yourself. Um, but depending on the program, this might be too complex or if the access patterns are too dynamic, this might not make sense, in which case you might want to fall back on something like CAR4 that does it online for you. Um, with that, I would like to point you to our release. We will do a release of this in probably end of next week. So feel free to download it and use it. And with that, I'm open for questions. So um, I was wondering, how do you deal with the case where you might have more than one application using a single machine, where you might not be able to be clear as to what the proper amount of memory allocation is for replicating versus distributing? So we haven't considered that yet, but if you think about it, what you would have to do is you would have to modify the show runtime in each of these applications to talk to each other. If you can't guarantee that, so if not all of the applications on your system are using show, I think you might want to use a combination of having these um, hardware performance counters that give you exactly these memory access patterns on each NUMA node, and you use these 
and feed them also into the show runtime to help show to tune the memory allocation. Thank you. Hi, uh, Devesh from Facebook. I have two questions uh, under that. So one is, did you uh, look at l like Spark and SparkQ and other sorts of Java-based uh, data processing DSL systems? Uh, I mean, I can understand the difficulty why you wouldn't, but um, uh, that's one. Um, and second is, so this stuff, like this, the I'm wondering how much of this is applicable to non-graph processing because one of the interesting things is that you assume that, let's say, an index l going from one node to another is a random access operation. So, you, and that's 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 true in graphs, but it's probably not true always in other uh, settings, like let's say an ML setting. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so, so in that respect, would something like a sampling-based approach, where you kind of, or some sort of a dynamic runtime-based approach, where you can kind of observe how the application is doing on a subset of the data or something, and then kind of use that to infer, I don't know. Yeah, OK, so first question, um, we did not evaluate this in anything else as the um, graph um, DSL. We did do it for um, low-level programs, but we have only one DSL. The reason for this is that um, they tend to be quite complex to modify it. So if you are not, if you're not um, one of the people that actually wrote that DSL compiler, it's not that easy to figure out how to modify it to do what, um, what we needed to do. Um, that's the first part. Um, the second part, so there is nothing in Joel that is tied to a graph per se. You need to understand for your high-level program what the access patterns are. But there are many domains where you know that. For example, for machine learning, if you have two uh, matrices, you might also know this. Um, or if you are in a database world and you have some SQL query, you might know what these access patterns are. But yes, of course, we assume that this knowledge is there. Uh, Ed Bunion from EPFL, the other ETH. <laughs> uh, <laughs> great work. Uh, so my question is, in the memory subsystem, there, there are two independent dimensions. One is the memory itself in the DRAM, which is NUMA, right? And then the other one is the cache hierarchy, mm -hmm. uh, which is fundamental processor performance. So my question is that you actually looked at also optimizing how and whether the caches are efficiently used for those workloads and whether there's an opportunity to explore and improve the cache performance. We haven't done it in the context of this work. There's a couple of other projects we are running that do exactly that, where we look at um, which algorithms can be scheduled on the together to prevent exactly that, that they are um, colliding in the cache. Is that what you mean? I mean, multi in, in a consolidation workload, for example, but also even in this particular workload, if you run a single workload, you may or may not use efficiently your layer three caches. Yeah, no, we haven't looked at that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So this may be a little open-ended, and we can pick it up later, but uh, once upon a time, there was a system called the uniform system and uh, that worked on NUMAs and solved a similar problem. But their approach was, uh, in essence, to randomize the allocation of memory, just smear it out all over the place, and then try to figure out which processor should do which operation based on which memory it needed. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could leverage that sort of technique to move the processing, uh, not only move the data around to make the processing more uh, convenient, but also to move the processing near the data. Yeah, so absolutely. I think the next step here is to integrate that with a proper runtime. So if you do scheduling um, and you do the scheduling right, you can make sure that you schedule work close to where the data is. And then you can, in fact, um, distribute the data randomly in the beginning. Um, this is actually something we do as well. We have an array um, implementation that just randomly distributes the memory. If you don't know anything about the access patterns, that's what you want to do because you have proper load balancing then. But still, you might benefit from an approach like Shoal because Shoal gives you a good um, initial configuration of the memory. Now, then you can, orthogonally to that, you can still migrate pages around later if that makes sense for your application. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, no, I, th I think your approach that does the analysis in the compiler is more powerful, but I think there might still be a little bit there. That you yes, can I, th I think they are orthogonal. I think you can use both. And that's probably what you want to do in a system like that. Yes, thank you.